30 Odd Minutes is sponsored in part by Digital Dowsing. Who are you powered by? For the next 30 minutes, we will explore the unexplained. From mysteries beyond our galaxy. To ghostly phenomena in our own backyard. We will dive into our psychic abilities. And explore everything from conspiracies to the just plain weird. Welcome to 30 Odd Minutes. If the truth is out there, we will find it. But only by sheer accident. Hey, welcome to 30 Odd Minutes. I'm Jeff Belanger. I'm your captain. With me, First Officer Andrew Lake. How are you? Pretty good, Jeff. Pretty good. Ju- digging the new suits? Yes, I know. These are uh, fire resistant. That's I, right. But... <laughs> But that's all. <laughs> Don't get water on them. They'll, they'll dissolve. No, no. All right. but still cool nonetheless. Absolutely. Cool. Well, welcome aboard the mothership. We have set this thing down right in front of the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum in Weston, West Virginia. Appropriate for this ship. It does. It looks scary back there. And we're glad to have you guys with us. If you're watching the show live online at www.30oddminutes.com, jump on our chat room because we can see everything that you're saying. And uh, we might even read it during the show if we don't look too distracted. So... Shoutouts, new welcomes. What's oh, yes. On? We have a shout out for Born Community Television on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. I want to thank you guys for receiving our signal. And remember, if you should ever stop, we will take the Born Bridge out with our tractor beam. Absolutely. We can do it. That's true. We, we have the capability. All right. Hey, uh, rough news this week. Yeah. Harold Ramis. Harold yeah. Ramis has passed away. And. Uh, and just, uh, you know, of course, anyone who says that they weren't inspired by Ghostbusters in some way is lying. You know, any yeah. paranormal investigator. And also, today is kind of a special day. I don't know if you know this, but it's your birthday. That's right. So let me, let me tell you about the Twinkie. This is... What about the Twinkie? Tell them about... I look thought, it. I thought the Twinkie was over and done with. I thought we lost the Twinkie. I thought this was a rare animal. The Twinkie is back. Make a wish. Did it come true? No, I'm still wearing a red jumpsuit. All right, sorry. All right, tough break, tough break. All right, well, you know, we are talking about ghosts. And, yeah, help yourself, and you can enjoy that while Dr. Dreck regales us about his latest invention. Greetings, oddballs. Dr. Dreck here, and we're talking about ghosts. And, you know, there's all these kind of ghost apps that you can get on your phones and your readers and all that. I don't mean the, the ghost apps that put, you know, phony ghosts and real pictures and stuff that just, you know, people, you know, put on YouTube and stuff. But uh, I mean the kind of ghost apps that's supposed to detect them. And I got one installed right here on my little gadget. And I have been waiting to detect a ghost for the last uh, 15 minutes. I don't see... Oh, wait a minute. <gasps> it is... There's something... There is something here. Where are you? Where are you? Show yourself. Whoa. Booberry. Oh. Oh, when are you coming back? Are you coming back in Halloween? And you were here last Halloween, I think. Oh, but it's a ghost again. Oh, no. Don't. 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 Don't leave me. No. Oh, I guess I gotta wait till the fall, I, if I'm lucky. Oh, well, I guess I can conjure up old cereals. I am kind of hungry. I wonder if I can... What are some bacon and eggs here? See this? You know, ghost, ghost food has no calories. All right. Thank you, Dr. Dreck. How was the Twinkie? It was excellent. It was good. Tell him about the Twinkie. I love mm. it. And rest in peace, Harold Ramis. He really will be missed. That's a shame. You will be, Harold. All right. Okay. West Virginia is known as the Mountain State. It turns out those mountains hold mysteries, ghostly mysteries. And we're going to explore some of those haunts in this mission. Our guest is a leading expert in the paranormal, metaphysical, and spiritual fields, and the author of more than 50 books, including West Virginia Monsters and the Encyclopedia of Ghosts and Spirits. She's worked full-time in this field since 1983 and has conducted hundreds of investigations of haunted places, including sites throughout West Virginia. Tonight, she's here to tell us about her latest work, The Big Book of West Virginia Ghost Stories. Please welcome Rosemary Ellen Guiley. Yeah! Good to have you back, Rosemary. How are you? Oh, I'm doing very well. I just got back from uh, two weeks in Arizona where I had a very nice sunbreak. Nice. Well, uh, well, welcome back to the, the cold north. And, uh, and, and, but we're, we're not talking about the cold north or Arizona. We're talking about West Virginia. Not a lot of people know this. I lived there for a year. Huntington. 
No kidding. True story. True story. And then we got out. What drew you to the Mountain State, Rosemary? It started with the Mothman right. site. In, uh, uh, well, be, John Keel was a very good friend of mine, and um, he wrote the Mothman prophecies about that wave of mysterious activity that hit the Point Pleasant and Mid-Ohio River Valley in 1966-67. And uh, after the movie was made based on the book, an annual festival started run by Jeff Walmsley, and I started going down there. I'm uh, one of the main speakers now every year uh, Mm -hmm. since 2004. I found that West Virginia is a very unusual state. Uh, you know, for a small state, it is packed with some of the most interesting uh, mysterious creatures, ghost stories, haunted activity, weird sites, you name it, West Virginia's got it. So I started spending a lot of time down there doing investigations, traveling around. I never lived there like you did. And Huntington, by the way, that's one of the most haunted places in the state. Coincidence? Uh, but I've spent a great deal of time there, so I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to collect all this into um, this ghost book now. Right. Let's, let's just start briefly with Mothman. We have a picture of the, the great statue there in town. Um, it, it really is one of these stories that captivated us, not just because of the Mothman prophecy, but then, of course, the movie. And, and now it's just because it's a cottage industry right there in Point Pleasant, right? I mean, th- this creature. Uh, but he's not unique, correct? I mean, he, creatures of the same description show up elsewhere. They certainly do. In fact, winged humanoid figures have been reported for centuries all over the world. Um, And uh, they're dark figures. Sometimes they're described as having bird wings. Sometimes they have leathery wings. And uh, Mothman um, was kind of, he was unique in a way uh, because he was seen so often during that 13-month period. Now, this entity... And didn't have a head. Uh, depictions of Mothman show him with a head and red eyes, but he had two red eyes set in what would be the shoulder blades of a human being. And uh, all of a sudden he started appearing uh, along with a host of other high strangeness, mysterious lights in the sky, landed craft, poltergeist activity, men in black, missing animals, uh, prophecies, messages from aliens. The whole place just went haywire for 13 months. And uh, now Mothman is uh, a figure in folklore. Uh, He he is often seen around the world. Uh, There have been uh, sightings reported around disasters. In fact, Mothman has kind of become a doomsday omen. I'm not quite sure that's an accurate portrayal of him. But I think that a window opened in the mid-Ohio River Valley. That place has had a haunted history since white settlers first became acquainted with it. It goes way back into Indian lore. And uh, I think a window opened up between dimensions, and for 13 months, all kinds of crazy stuff poured through, and then that window snapped shut. Do you think the bridge collapse has anything to do with, this, do with the sighting of Mothman, or, or do you think that that uh, uh, just a, just an unusual coincidence? I think that it has something to do with the wave of activity. Mothman was seen around the bridge before its collapse, uh, but... Um, I think that the whole area had a wind-up of tremendous psychokinetic energy. Uh, Some of it may have been caused by this interdimensional opening. Some of it was contributed to by the intense interest of the people in the area, the investigators who came, the hundreds of people who flocked to various locations hoping to catch a sight of Mothman or one of the aliens said to be in the area. And uh, this may have been a contributing factor to something that was already a problem with the bridge, this structural defect. Sure, sure, understood. Okay, Mothman, as we said, could be its own show. But uh, let's, let's bunt, jump over to uh, Parkersburg, West Virginia, to the Riverview Cemetery. Andrew, you love cemeteries. Yes, I spend uh, quite a bit of time with them. Uh, right. Yeah. I mean, considering someday you're going to spend all your time yeah, All there, my time in one, yes. You'd, you'd think you'd spend a little less now. But uh, <laughs> this one, I mean, it's beautiful, like so many you know, in the region. Tell us, Rosemary, what makes Riverview special? Riverview, Riverview Cemetery is home to um, a statue, a monument called the Weeping Woman. Okay. And, uh, Andrew, if you didn't get your wish when you blew out the candle on your Twinkie, I tell you right now, go straight to Parkersburg, to Riverview Cemetery, and put your hands on the hands of this monument. The weeping woman belongs to the Jackson family, 
And uh, over the uh, years, uh, this cemetery goes back to the 1800s, uh, over the years she has acquired quite a reputation. It is said that she gets up and walks around at night. People can hear strange sounds in the cemetery. There are lots of phantoms and activity, but the main thing is she's a wish granter. Hmm. And it is said that those who are pure of heart can have their wish granted if they go up to the statue and place their hands on her hands and make a wish. And did you? I did. You know, I had the craziest experience. I was there during the day while I was doing research for this book with a group of friends. They were all Mothman cronies. we just come from the Mothman uh, festival that goes on every year. And I decided to give it a try. So um, I, I made a wish, and I went up and put my hands on her hands, and immediately I was swept into like this time and space distortion. I felt like I was suddenly thrown backwards, uh, that I was moving back through space and maybe even time itself at a very rapid pace. And uh, the surroundings around me uh, blurred out. Uh, it was quite an experience. Uh, and I believe that something happened in that moment. Uh, if there is such a thing as forces coming together in the perfect time to um, manifest a wish, that was it, because I did get my wish about a year later. Hmm. Were you able to find out where this started? I mean, who, do you know who the first person was to learn this about the statue, about this, this property? It seems to be a fairly contemporary origin. Uh, back in the uh, 1800s, um, I, I can't find any mention of this story. Um, it seems to have grown up as sort of an urban legend uh, within the last few decades. And um, especially, it is cited as uh, a wish granter for women who wish to get pregnant. Uh, you know, there are many kinds of uh, wish granting statues and places where people can go to, um, to ask for a boon from spirit. And uh, families who, you know, men and women who want to have children and they haven't been able to, uh, that's a pretty popular request. Well, it wasn't even on my long list, let alone my short list, but I had uh, another wish that I really wanted. And um, I have to keep it secret because that's the nature of wishes. When, when you tell on your wish, then uh, it does something to the energy. But um, I urged my friends to try it, too, uh, to go and put their hands on the statue. And they didn't have quite the profound experience I did, but they all thought that there was a very peculiar energy around the weeping woman. And, and Andrew, that's legend tripping, right? I mean, right. you hear a story like that, you're in the cemetery, I dare you not to try it. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know? Yeah, I mean, if, I'm, if I've gone there and someone brings it up, of course I'm going to try right. it. Right. You, you say, that, I mean, this story itself has some life to it. And then how many people have laid their hands right there and, and brought their wishes, their energy, their thoughts to it? Um, th there's power there. There's really something yeah. to it. You don't have to believe or disbelieve. I mean, this, this area is now infused with a legend. And it draws us in, and, and now it's in a book. We've talked about it here. More people are going to go, and, uh, and the legend will grow. And yeah. That's, that's, that's yep. amazing. All right, Rosemary, we don't want to spend too much time in a cemetery. We, we would like you to take us to jail, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> and, and West Virginia's got a very, a very famous haunted prison. Tell us about Moundsville. Uh, Moundsville has the reputation of being America's bloodiest, most violent prison. It's a historic site now. Uh, and a favorite of paranormal investigators. I have in investigated there three times, and I've had experiences every time. There isn't a, a square inch in that prison that doesn't have something going on in it. Right. It was no. built in the 1800s for West Virginia's most violent criminals. And <clears throat> I'm going to have to take a drink of water. No, I came go back ahead. Arizona. Sure. <coughs> no problem. I've actually been to Moundsville. Uh, I've been to Moundsville Penitentiary. It's up, up in that little finger region right next to Pennsylvania, sort of near Pittsburgh. And I, I felt the same way. It's incredible. You walk in and, and you just you feel it. I don't know if you subscribe to the stone tape theory or whatever, but men were hanged there. People were killed. I got to interview one of the former wardens. And when you, when you start to learn about life in a prison, you start to realize how you don't ever want to go there no. for more than a visit. Where, you know, a guy would get shivved over a pack of cigarettes because that's all your life is worth. Yeah. When, when you're there for 10, 15, 20 years or maybe forever, your life is simply worth nothing more than a pack of cigarettes. And you kind of feel that seeping in all around you. 
and and it's uh, you know you walk those halls, you see those prison cells. It's creepy. It's creepy as all get out. Now, did you have any personal experiences inside Rosemary? <coughs> I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. I had uh, some allergies in Arizona, and I <clears throat> thought I was okay. <laughs> <coughs> no worries. No, take your time. Uh, uh, yes, I did. I had EVPs. I've seen uh, shadow people, apparitions. Had um, a lot of communication over the Frank's box. Uh, Red Cell is one of the most active areas. There mm-hmm. was um, a <clears throat> prisoner there who was... Stabbed to death outside of his cell. He had murdered his parents and stored their body parts in his refrigerator. A lot of prisoners didn't like him. And uh, he got the nickname Red because of all the blood that sprayed around uh, as he died in his cell. And it's haunted by what appears to be a very angry man that people believe is Red. Uh, In the area where people have been hung, there are apparitions that walk around. There's um, a man who was scheduled to be hanged, <clears throat> and the scaffolding of uh, the trap door opened before uh, the actual hanging, and he fell and was injured. They picked him up, marched him back up the steps, and then hung him proper, and his ghost still walks around today. Sure. Uh, the area in the basement called the Sugar Shack, which was a recreation area, uh, and prisoners fought and uh, argued and probably did a little dealing on the side. That also is home to a lot of EVPs and shadow figures. I remember being in the Sugar Shack, and like Rosemary said, it's the recreation area, but I said, well, where did it get the name the Sugar Shack? And then I was reminded this is prison, and that's where one went for some sugar. Yeah. yeah. Whether, whether the guy was uh, willing or not, not willing, yeah. and usually not, um, that was, uh, that's where the nickname came from. So, no, frightening place, and, and prisons are, you know, yeah. the despair, the, the idea, you know, when you walk in, even visiting, you walk into one of these prisons, and you walk in, and you say, all right, I'm just here for the day, I get to leave, but you, you can, it's not too hard to imagine the mindset of what it must be like walking in knowing this is it That's for it. five years, or I'm ten here. years, I'm or, not going anywhere. yeah, this is home, so, creepy stuff, Rosemary, we're going to take a quick break for the news, we're going to come back and talk about some more West Virginia haunts with Rosemary Ellen Guiley, right after this. America's smallest state in the Union, Rhode Island, has had two very interesting UFO sightings in the winter of 2014. Around 5.30 p.m. on January 31st, a couple driving down the highway in the town of West Greenwich noticed two dark objects hovering in the sky. The couple said that they took the very first exit off the highway and tried to find a better location to get a clearer look at these mysterious crafts that were high above a dense forest of tall trees. They were able to take only a few pictures of the objects that they described as looking like discs with domes on top. Unfortunately, their pictures do not show much detail in the waning light of the late afternoon. The couple say that as they lost sight of the two UFOs, they noticed a military helicopter flying in the same direction that the objects left in. An even stranger sighting was reported on February 17th in the city of Warwick, Rhode Island. An unnamed witness said that as they were driving down Warwick Avenue that evening, They saw what looked like a large metallic triangle with a dark dome on its top hovering silently above a nearby field. The strange craft had red and bright white lights along its side, but the witness is certain that it wasn't any known conventional aircraft. This person claims that they turned their car around to go back and take a video, but the UFO had disappeared from sight in the short time it took them to move their vehicle. If these were in fact extraterrestrial visitors, they may be after Little Rhodey's secret weapon, New York System wieners. I'm Andrew Lake, and oddly enough, that's the news. Thank you, Andrew. And we're back talking about the big book of ghost stories from West Virginia, big book of West Virginia ghost stories with Rosemary Ellen Guiley. And uh, while we were checking the chat room, which you guys are are very busy in right now, Way to Go Mom made a a great observation that maybe West Virginia is so haunted because, as John Denver said, it's almost heaven. Aw, I get it. I totally get it. All right. From prisons to insane asylums, there's also a remarkable one in Weston, West Virginia. Uh, Tell us about that one, Rosemary. Trans-Allegheny used to be um, one of the biggest mental hospitals, uh, and um, it, too, is haunted in every corridor. It was constructed in the 19th century, according to a plan by a man named Thomas Kirkbride. 
he believed that mental patients really needed fresh air and lots of space uh, rather than being cramped in cell-like environments. And so his, uh, his structures were these sprawling buildings that were just absolutely enormous. Now, a lot of very um, <clears throat> deranged people were housed in this mental hospital. Uh, people have left residual energy. Uh, violent crimes took place there. People were attacked, killed. Um, <clears throat> inmates turned on each other. People committed suicide. All kinds of uh, intense emotional dramas took place there um, until the place was closed in the 1990s. And now uh, it is open to investigators and to people who want a historical tour. It was purchased by a private individual in 2008 and has been open to the public. Yeah, I've been there uh, as well. We did Ghost Adventures Live from that uh, location. And just walking through that building, again, it's one of those places I don't consider myself very sensitive. But you walk into a place like that and you just feel it. And you hear some of the stories about, uh, you know, uh, I remember going through old ledgers, looking at the reasons people were committed. You could just have your spouse committed. You know, generally the male, the man would have his wife committed just because he was tired of her. You yeah. know, just pull up and, and that's that. You know, she's committed. Uh, and then, of course, during, during uh, tough economic times, people were committing themselves because you'd get a roof over your head. That's right. You'd get three, it's better than living on the street. That's yeah. right. You'd get three meals a day and then it's overcrowded. And this guy, Kirkbride, had such a great idea. Let's treat these people like people. Let's give them open space. Let's let them be self-sufficient. And that worked for a while. And then it got overcrowded. And then there was deinstitutionalization. And, and the conditions just got so horrible. I remember speaking with a nurse uh, who worked in the uh, alcohol and drug rehab center who said she remembers interviewing a patient. And there were literally cockroaches crawling over him. And it was happening so often, they didn't, the patients didn't even bother to swat them anymore. Uh. You know, it's, oh. these are human beings, and, and, and they, got, they get forget, uh, forgotten about inside this building. What does that do, Rosemary, to a location when, when uh, really, what borderline atrocities uh, is what we're talking about, what does that do to the actual building, to the, to the place? It creates a lot of residual energy. It's a very heavy energy, as you've experienced yourself. And um, <clears throat> the place is full of imprints. Uh, this, this is emotional residue left behind by very unhappy, angry, and uh, even badly treated people. Uh, there were a lot of electroshock therapies that went on there. Sometimes uh, in the 19th century, patients were confined in uh, rather cruel manners. In the mid-20th century, they started doing lobotomies there. Right. And uh, that, that was a horrible procedure. So this residual energy creates a lot of um, imprints like sounds, footsteps, shadowy figures moving around in the same place. It also attracts a lot of spirit energy. And I think um, vampiric and low-level spirits who like to feed off that energy uh, reside in a place like that. They hang around, and they can create a lot of disturbances, too. Right, I remember reading about the uh, the ice pick lobotomies, which not literally an ice pick, but it, was, but, it, it yeah. only took minutes. They would go up in, and pulled yeah. out the lobe, and, and the and you're, you're rendered, uh, you know, pretty docile after that. But the question you ask is, what's your cognitive ability, and and who can you ask? Someone who's gone through the procedure, you know, isn't yeah. going to have much of a, a point of reference, and so. Uh, stuff that's seen as, as barbaric today, like Rosemary said, electroshock therapy, cold water baths, ice yeah, water baths, yeah. uh, you know, all of these kinds of things at the time were cutting edge treatment for, for mental you know, disabilities. And, and you wonder, too, there's a whole I think there's a whole lesson for society to place like Trans-Allegheny. We talked about all the good it did in the beginning, the overcrowding, the deinstitutionalization, the conditions were awful and finally it shut down. Where are the people now? The people that needed that place, where did they go? You know, um, <clears throat> When um, the place was shut down and it was overcrowded, uh, the patients were dispersed to other facilities. Mm -hmm. And some of them may have even been turned back to family. Uh, you know, that involuntary uh, commitment uh, where someone could be committed to an institution by family members just to get rid of them, that was a horrible procedure. Uh, and fortunately, we don't do that anymore. 
Right. No, thank goodness. All right. <clears throat> One more stop on our, on our grand tour of West Virginia. Let's go back to Point Pleasant and talk about the Low Hotel. Uh, is this a place you've stayed, Rosemary? I stay at the Low every time I go to Point Pleasant. It is one of my favorite places, and it is very haunted. It's the only hotel in town. It was built in the uh, late 1800s as a luxury hotel, and uh, the Ohio River Valley was um, well-trafficked with um, a lot of trade and commerce and wealthy people. Uh, It was purchased by a family named Low, and that's um, how it got its name. It was the Spencer Hotel before. There's lots of residual activity at this hotel. I've seen apparitions uh, go up and down the hallway. Uh, Many of the rooms are haunted. They have um, voices, apparitions, strange sounds. The faucets go on and off. The doors open and close. Sid Hatfield, who's um, uh, part of the famous Hatfield-McCoy family dispute, he was uh, actually killed in a coal mine uh, miner's um, uh, riot. Uh, in Mingo, West Virginia, but he liked to stay at the Low Hotel, and his ghost is in one of the rooms. Uh, I've done Ouija board experiences there that uh, have gotten some very strange communications, and um, if you stay at the Low Hotel, and especially if you like to wander around late at night, you're likely to come up against something that isn't of this reality. And what do you think, Andrew, about you know transient places like hotels? I know this past weekend, right. Saturday, we were at the Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast. Right. We know the history there, but we also know every night someone else stays there. People come and go all yep. the time. You know, uh, what is it about transient places that just kind of lends itself to these stories? You know, I don't know. It, it's it's awful strange. I mean, I know you have a lot of people um, uh, out on the road in desperate situations and may find themselves in a temporary setting like a hotel or a motel and then do foolish things like take their lives. Right. Uh, maybe end relationships, uh, either by having affairs and being caught in the, in the trauma of that. And we know sometimes jealous husbands kill uh, their wives' lovers and so on and so forth. But, uh, yeah, hotels, motels, they do seem to have things that just linger, these, these moments in time that were just sad, awful, violent things that just seem to stay there. Right. And they and, never check out. And, of course, this... <laughs> and, of course, this place is in uh, Point Pleasant, uh, right at, at the epicenter of Mothman. And, and so you've got all these legends that swirl around. And, Rosemary, I know you, you, your depth of knowledge runs a lot deeper than just ghosts. Um, is it tough to, to sometimes turn those other uh, parts of your brain off when you're focusing on a project like this that's just about ghost stories? Uh, well, you run into everything across the board, and I did do a book called uh, West Virginia Monsters, right. uh, where I look at the mysterious creatures in the state. But often, um, when, when you go to a place that's haunted or you do an investigation, you're, you're likely to run up against a variety of things. You might see something that uh, seems to fall into the mysterious creature category, as Mothman would, and um, maybe uh, the next time you look, there's an apparition or some sort of residual haunting effect going on. So, um, and mysterious lights in the sky. You know, investigators really have to uh, be up on uh, all sorts of activities to relate one thing to another. Uh, many of these haunted areas are famous for UFO activity uh, as well. And uh, so we need to look at the relationship between these things. Right. I completely agree with you, Rosemary. It's so true. I think uh, early on, you know, the, the pioneers that have doing this, like Rosemary, like, like people before her as well, looked at everything. Yeah. And then everything got specialized. I do ghosts, you do UFOs. And I think we're seeing a, a, a renaissance back to you do have to put it all on the table because if you're looking through the world just through ghost-colored glasses or yep. UFO-colored glasses... You miss a lot of other stuff. Rosemary, we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. The name of the book is The Big Book of West Virginia Ghost Stories by Rosemary Ellen Guiley. We'll, of course, have links to her site and her work from ours and from all of us to all of you in the mothership. Stay odd.